Hello everyone, I'm Russ Barkley, and this is our weekly research update for the week ending June 16th. There are a number of articles that were published over the past week, and I've listed them in the thumbnail sketch that goes with this video. We're just going to talk about four of these articles uh, and uh, talk about their significance for understanding ADHD. The first article, as you see here, uh, is an article that was published in the Journal of Neuropsychiatric Disease and Treatment, and it was a review of the relationship between neurodiversity and psychosexual functioning for children and adults with autism spectrum disorder or ADHD, so two neurodevelopmental disorders. This is very important despite the uh, sensitivity, if you will, of this topic these days, uh, in the trade media, it's important to understand the psychosexual orientation, uh, the social satisfaction, the degree of sexual relationships, and even sexual dysfunction that might be occurring in people with these two neurodevelopmental disorders, often referred to as being neurodiverse or neurodivergent. So this study came out of the UK, Susan Young and colleague Kelly Kokalis. Uh, and they were able to identify in their systematic review of the literature about 17 studies that involved uh, autism spectrum disorder, 19 studies that involved ADHD, uh, and all of these studies had to meet certain inclusion criteria to make sure that the studies were reasonably rigorous, had control groups and other appropriate scientific controls so that we could uh, put some confidence uh, in the results of the research. And as you can see here, I've highlighted it. Uh, overall, uh, the study suggested poor psychosexual functioning in individuals with both of these conditions when they were compared to their neurotypical peers. Uh, they found specifically that there was a lack of satisfaction in their sexual relationships in general, uh, that there was more sexual dysfunction uh, that there was increased risky sexual behaviors, uh, and in addition, an increase in being sexually victimized. Uh, they found that these difficulties appeared to occur more in females with these two disorders than in males. Uh, and specifically, they found that those with autism spectrum disorder were also more likely to identify with a non-heterosexual orientation compared to their typical peers. Now, remember, there's a wide range of individual findings in these studies, uh, but what we're looking at here is as a group across these various studies, 17 and 19 respectively, uh, what we're seeing here is an increase in some sexual difficulties, different sexual orientation, uh, risky sexual behavior, specifically for ADHD, by the way, uh, and other difficulties. So very important research, uh, and uh, hopefully this will lead to further studies. The authors were very careful to identify what they thought were gaps in our knowledge base relating to risky sexual behavior in particular, uh, as well as those that might pertain to sexual health and a vulnerability to being victimized uh, or to perpetrating uh, sexual victimization on others. So lots more research needs to be done in this area, but in general, it seems to replicate uh, the findings, especially for ADHD in my own longitudinal study that took place in southeastern Wisconsin over a period of 20 to 25 years. Uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Fisher and I evaluated these children every five years, and we noticed as they moved into adolescence and then into young adulthood, they had a much higher rate of risky sexual behavior, starting sexual intercourse earlier than others, less likely to use contraception, more likely to change partners, that is, they had shorter sexual relationships with other people, uh, and on top of that, an increase in the risk for teenage pregnancy, as you can imagine, if you're not using contraception, as well as an increase in risk for sexually transmitted disease. So, and those findings have now been replicated in several other studies since we published our results. So this paper includes many other studies that were not available when we did our research, but seems to be consistent with that pattern of increased sexual difficulties, poor sexual relationships, risky sexual behavior, 
and for women in particular, a risk for being victimized. So th that's our first paper to review this week. Our second paper, uh, somewhat related to the first, appeared in the Journal of Health Psychology. Uh, and this is a study that comes to us, I believe this is out of Canada. Let me just double check down here. Yes, that's right, Saskatoon. Uh, and it's a study of dysmenorrhea and the psychological well-being among females with ADHD. Now, if you're not familiar with it, uh, although women are, uh, dysmenorrhea, as you can see here, uh, refers to the dull, throbbing, cramp-like pain that can occur uh, emanating from the lower abdomen just before and during the monthly menstrual cycle. Uh, and it's often classified as primary um, or as secondary. If it's primary, it's not related to any other pelvic pathology. If it's secondary, it's known to have some organic basis besides just uh, the monthly cramping, if you will. Uh, and about 10% of cases are secondary, but most are primary, and most females report some degree of dysmenorrhea during uh, or just before their menstrual cycle. So this study is looking at 266 females who had ADHD as a diagnosis. Uh, and they looked at symptom severity, they looked at degree of dysmenorrhea, they also looked at emotional regulation difficulties, uh, and then studied how much these moderated each other in their relationships. And then finally, they looked at global psychological well-being. Uh, and as you can see in the highlighted area here, ADHD symptom severity was negatively correlated with psychological well-being. Uh, again, we've seen that repeatedly in other research, that the more ADHD there is, the more health difficulties and the more problems with just general overall psychological adjustment. Specifically, ADHD symptom severity was positively correlated with a degree of dysmenorrhea severity during monthly menses. They also found that emotion regulation skills were not a moderator of that relationship. Some people felt that because ADHD predisposes to emotional dysregulation, uh, it would be the emotional dysregulation that was being worsened by the dysmenorrhea symptoms. And that does not necessarily appear to be the case here. It looks like this is directly related to the ADHD severity. They also found that ADHD was negatively correlated, as I said, with psychological well-being, but that that was not moderated by the degree of dysmenorrhea or by the emotion regulation difficulty. So overall, as it says here, a positive association between ADHD severity and dysmenorrhea severity in this sample. But the degree of emotion regulation did not seem to be a moderator of those findings. So uh, an important paper, because we have very little on women with ADHD and how their hormonal changes, both across the month, across the lifespan, affect the degree of their symptom, symptom severity and vice versa. Uh, and so these kinds of studies are important. Nice size, sample size here, over 260 women, uh, and a good measurement of these constructs. So uh, my congratulations to the authors for adding to what is a very small literature so far on uh, the well-being of women with ADHD relative to, in this case, their menstrual cycle. The third study I want to talk about here uh, comes from the U.S., and it's by my friend Scott Collins, uh, who originally was at Duke University. Uh, probably, I think he was when this study was done. He's since moved on to employment in uh, industry. But this is a, a longitudinal study that is looking at uh, ADHD status and medication status in the body mass index of individuals with ADHD uh, and without who are going through obesity treatment in the obesity treatment center at the university. So again, we've got those with ADHD, those without, everybody's coming in to an obesity clinic and undergoing a treatment plan and they're being followed for how well the treatment in, uh, influences their loss of body mass index, in other words, their weight loss. Secondarily, the study also looked at blood pressure to see if that was changing as a consequence of uh, all of these variables, ADHD status, as well as treatment status, uh, and then decline in body mass index 
as well. By treatment, I mean stimulant medication treatment. So, okay, that's the study. Uh, it's a very well done study uh, that used a large sample over 456 youth that had come in who were overweight, evaluated for their obesity, and entered the pediatric weight management program at the university. So what did they find? As you can see here in the highlighted area, the youth without ADHD experienced a significantly faster decline in their body weight compared to those with ADHD. So it looks like those with ADHD don't respond quite as well to the treatment, that is the weight management program, as the non-ADHD people do. And that makes sense. ADHD is a self-regulation disorder. It requires self-regulation to engage in self-improvement and to engage specifically in these weight management methods that are being recommended to the children and families. Uh, so it makes sense that they would struggle more with the weight management program given their self-regulation deficits. Interestingly, they did find that the youth who had ADHD and were on medication lost weight faster than did the youth with ADHD who were not taking medication. So this suggests that being on stimulant medication while going through a weight management clinic program does help people with ADHD uh, lose weight, and in this case, interact with and engage the treatment plan in order to lose weight. So a very important recommendation there for people with ADHD. If you're going to go through a weight loss program, probably better off to do it on medication. And again, you know why, because the medication improves not just the ADHD symptoms, but the executive functioning and self-regulation of the individual, allowing them to engage the treatment more successfully. Finally, just as an aside, they did not find that either ADHD status or stimulant medication use had much, if any, of an effect on blood pressure over time during the treatment program. So uh, again, I think a very important study, a very large sample size, so pretty robust findings here. Uh, and important because we, people hadn't looked at this connection uh, previously, how much medication helps uh, youth with ADHD, with their weight loss, and so on. So uh, again, a very nice study, and my thanks to Scott Collins for publishing that. Finally, we have a study out of Brazil. This is in the International Journal of Advanced Engineering Research and Science. Very interestingly, uh, I would not have thought to have published an ADHD article there, but here you go. Uh, this is a study, a qualitative study, I'll explain that in just a moment, on what the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic was on the mental health of children with ADHD in Brazil. Uh, and the study involved uh, a relatively small sample, as you can see here, about 40 participants, but they were interviewed in detail. That's what it means to do a qualitative study. The authors weren't so much in measuring things objectively or numerically uh, as much as they were just getting an impression from these individuals of what it was like during the COVID lockdown and social distancing. And following that, when we reopened society, in this case down in Brazil, uh, and what was life like for them? And so they were collecting questionnaires about anxiety, depression, irritability, sleep, and so on, both during the quarantine and following the quarantine period. And, and what did they find? You can see it here in the highlight. Uh, the sample had a high prevalence of male children. That's fairly typical for ADHD. Uh, and what they found is that of the new behaviors that presented daily during the quarantining, irritability was quite high. 63% uh, roughly of the sample reported uh, increases in their ir irritability. Uh, also agitation was about 43%. Then when we reopened in the post-quarantine period, uh, these individuals reported a marked decrease in those particular symptoms, dropping now down to about 14 and 17 respect, uh, percent respectively for those two problems of irritability and agitation. So they also uh, found uh, that there were reported feelings of sadness in about 46% of the sample uh, during the quarantine and that this occurred one to two times a week or more during that quarantine period. When they returned to face-to-face -face activities, the reported feelings of sadness 
did not change. In fact, it looked like they increased slightly. So there was some continuation of the impact of the lockdown on the quality of life of these individuals, even after the social distancing and quarantining was removed. Uh, and we've seen that, I think, here in the US uh, in other research as well. If you're interested, Steve Becker, about a year ago in my newsletter, the ADHD Report, reviewed all of the published research available at that time on the effects of COVID-19, uh, that is the social distancing, quarantining, and so on, uh, on uh, ADHD children and teens. So you might want to have a look at that review if this uh, topic is of interest to you. Uh, lastly, they talked about sleep and they said that at the peak of the pandemic during the quarantine, 54% of the children showed anxiety uh, and also had uh, objectionable, that is oppositional behavior at bedtime uh, and that 31% reported having insomnia every day. The problem with that is that People with ADHD report high rates of insomnia and sleep difficulties anyway. And since there's no measurement here of what these kids were like before the lockdown, it's a little hard to evaluate that. But they did re-interview them about how their behavior was after the lockdown. And it, as it shows here, by the end of social quarantine, only 4% reported sleeping difficulties. So I think we can infer from this qualitative study that the measures taken during the COVID pandemic to quarantine and lockdown did have some significant effect on the sleeping difficulties, as well as depression and anxiety of these patients, not to mention, as you saw up here, irritability and agitation. So overall, the pandemic was perceived by these 40 individuals with ADHD as uh, having significant impact on their quality of life and well-being. So, so that's our four studies for this week. I hope you found the research review to be useful. There are other studies that I've listed over in the thumbnail sketch, some of them dealing with neuroimaging results uh, and so forth. And you can have a look at those and go find those in the journals uh, if you are interested. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll have another research update uh, very shortly because we had a lot of research published last week and this is just part one of my research update. I'll publish another one soon. Thanks so much. Be well. Take care.